Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about some of the most brutal campaigns present in the Old World custom campaign mod. When I say brutal, I mean in the sense that you are going to have a heck of a time getting through these campaigns as these uh, legendary lords in particular. Some of it may have to do the race they have, some of it may have to do with the particular starting position that they do have, the opponents that they have to deal with, or it may just have to do with the lords themselves and their faction mechanics. And starting it at number five, we have Scrag the Slaughter, who starts a war with the dwarves. That is particularly brutal for the ogres, seeing as they don't really have a good amount of armor piercing. Scrag does have gorgers from the very beginning of his campaign, uh, two gorger units that he does have, and he can he does have benefits for those gorgers, but having to fight the dwarves is not exactly the easiest path forward. To be fair, to be fair, the the Bugman's Brewery dwarves, they're probably going to be relatively easy to deal with. Once you win this initial battle, but look at this army over here. Iron breakers, artillery, quarrelers, longbeards. This is a pretty brutal campaign start. Sure, you again have two good units, you do have a hero, you do have Scrank himself, but that is not necessarily going to be an easy path going forward to deal with. And once you do overcome those odds against the dwarves, and to be fair, minor dwarf action, you'll overcome them, you then get to deal with the Empire. Now, typically speaking, the Empire is a faction that or a race that's relatively easy to deal with for a lot of other races. The problem is, Gelt, less so. So you have Gelt as a neighbor. And furthermore, it's not like you can just rush, uh, try and zerg rush Gelt, because uh, you may notice that there's a tiny little river over here that's going to make your efforts in doing that a bit annoying. So you're going to be slow down. You, just zerg rushing Gelt is going to be tricky. Now, mind you, Gelt does suffer from this uh, situation himself. It's dealing with Scrag as a neighbor is certainly not a fun experience. But I think, like, between playing the Empire, who, which has a lot of economic potential, even if they have a significant number of issues with their faction, and playing the Ogres, which are genuinely one of the worst races in the game, against the Empire and the other factions can be pretty rough indeed. You may have a potential ally in Skrulk, you may also have a nightmare in Skrulk as well. But regardless of how you deal with Skrulk, there is an inevitability that is going to happen in this campaign. Or rather, you could say it's two inevitabilities that you are probably going to have to uh, deal with in this uh, particular campaign. Uh, so the first inevitability is Forek. Forek is genuinely a nightmare of a legendary lord to have to fight against. He can fight and win against very powerful legendary lords. The reason is, between the runes he has, his own power, his starring army, his starring situation, uh, Forek becomes an absolute beast of a legendary lord. His army, his own army, is actually very strong. Now, if the dwarves were in such a crap tier race, in the hands of the player, Forek would be a lot better to play. Here's the thing, though. If you're playing on Legendary, a lot of the things that Legendary does specifically help with many of the issues that the Dwarves have. Recruitment, casualty replenishment, growth, income, upkeep. So that's one of the issues. Like, you get supercharged Forek, and Forek is already a beast in the hands of the player. You give him in the hands of the AI, you put them against Ogres. Things uh, don't necessarily end up uh, very well. And then you've got Ark and the Black to potentially worry about in the long term. Now, Tomb Kings wouldn't necessarily be too big of a challenge for the Ogres, but Arkan is. The reason Arkan is such a challenge is because Arkan starts with too damned army, army capacity. And here, in this particular campaign, what I routinely see Arkan do is I routinely see him expand across all of this territory. There's no major faction to stop him over here, so he's going to end up taking all of this territory. Again, you can make deals with him like you can with Skrulk. Uh, ogres can make deals basically with everyone. You don't even necessarily need to end up in a war with um, with Kelt, but the possibility is there. Remember, the AI is not particularly friendly to the AI. And also, you've got you've got Karak Norn to potentially deal with. You can bet that they're not going to be too happy with you. I can't imagine why, especially as you wipe out Bugman's uh, brewery. You might have Aphalorin joining in the fray as well. Like you're you're in a kind of danger spot with Aphalorin. So basically, if Durfu decides to come come against you, all of Aphalorin is gonna come against you. 
Now, there's a potential of this being handled correctly, right? There's a potential for this working out for you as the player, but there's also the potential of everything over here blowing up in your face. That's why I'd say it's a brutal campaign. Though it's certainly lower on this list because you can certainly handle it, but the Ogres just are an awful race. Their economy takes a very long time to build up. You do need to capture settlements, but you also need to build a lot of Ogre camps. There are mods that do improve the Ogres, but geez. Dealing with multiple Dwarven factions and the Skaven potentially and the Empire and the Wood Elves and eventually Ark in the Black who's just going to steamroll eventually after you've dealt with everything else and just show up and be like, sup, and annihilate you, potentially annihilate you. Yeah, that's um, kind of a brutal campaign, suffice to say. Oh, and I'm not even talking about the fact that, uh, that Vlad and Isabella are over here and they're probably going to steamroll everything in their path on the side of the river. Like, you see this entire area of the river? That belongs to Vlad and Isabella, effectively. They're just, like, in the hands of the eye, they're just going to take control over it. And yeah, Vlad and Isabella are nightmares on their own. I've routinely seen Vlad on his own, just his own, forget Isabella, forget his armies, just his own, annihilate m entire armies on his own in Emmanuel Bell. He's got the crazy amount of punishment, the credible stats, and he will get those items and make him even more powerful. It's not like you can just kill Vlad, oh, I get a couple of turns, he'll recover. No, he'll recover instantly. Fun times ahead. And number four, we have Trog, the Troll King of Norska. And oh boy, does Trog have a brutal campaign in this one. One of the advantages he used to have in Immortal Empires that he doesn't have in the Old World is that he would be able to relatively quickly get a Raider's Camp. So he would be able to get Berserkers, Marauder Berserkers, which are pretty powerful units, even if they are more of a glass cannon unit against range units in particular. But now... He no longer has that kind of benefit. And also what's pretty awkward is that the Wolf Forest starts under the control of the Sarl. And you start a war with the Brotherhood of the Bear, and you can certainly take this fort on turn one. The problem you're going to encounter very quickly over here is you're going to end up fighting Kislev with your Saring Army and basic Marauders. Which is certainly not an ideal situation to start your campaign in. Because basic marauders are, well, not that great. Now, as for the Sarl, well, <laughs> they do have a great territory. You could argue that it's a better plan to eliminate this army, raise this fort to the ground, and then march west. Uh, the problem with that particular approach is that Boris Ursus starts a war with the Sarl. And let me just put it plainly. If Trog goes to uh, goes in a fight against a full stack under Boris Ursus, who starts with war bears, ar uh, war bears, armor Cossars, and Sargard, as well as a Patriarch, yeah, that's going to be a bloodbath. You probably will be able to win, but damn, that, that's going to be an absolutely insane fight on your hands. And it doesn't necessarily get that much better later on. Oh, sure, you you can be friends with Azak, with the Chaos Factions, you can vassalize Kairos, Sigvald, Archeon, even if you play your cards right. Absolutely, all of those options are on the table and available. And once you do that, you do pretty much end up in the situation where the campaign is handed to you on a silver platter. Problem is, you don't start with any ports, and while there are two available over here, your economy is certainly going to take a hit until you get them, and you do ultimately want to end up getting them. And you have to play the diplomacy game of vassals, and vassals can either be really useful, like a greenskin vassal is an exceptionally useful vassal, or they can be useless, suffice to say. Uh, so you basically try and vassalize Azak as quickly as possible and let him fight Kislev, but then you've got other things. Dependent on how this fight can go, either Archeon annihilates Axiatl, or you end up having to deal with Boris Ursus, Grumbrindle, and Oxyatl at the same time, unless you play your cards right. Again, Boris Ursus alone is brutal. Grumbrindle is brutal. Oxyatl is nightmare light level for the Norskans to, uh, to deal with. I mean, the best thing you could do is just uh, wipe the floor with Silostra, because while she does have a ranged army, which is dangerous, it's a short ranged army that has really bad stats. Bad armor, bad leadership. And it's gunpowder, so gunpowder units to suffer quite a bit. So you can certainly annihilate Silostra and focus on taking the coast here. But at the same time, yeah, you've got this mess of a situation to sort out. You can, absolutely, you can sort it out. 
but you got to deal with some incredibly powerful Legion Lords to do so. So enjoy that particular dynamic. I mean, Norska is in a trouble spot for a lot of reasons. One of the things that makes it worse for Norska in particular is that they want to sack a settlement, they want to raise a settlement, and then they want to occupy it. Having to do that takes time. Time is precious, and it gives your opponents more time to build up, build better, bigger armies. Because dependent on how faction potential ends up working over here, and how the randomizer work, works, it can either be really easy, in the sense you may not have to deal with any of the, uh, with the dwarves or Oxyatol, or certainly deal with the Borosursus, or it can go very poorly. Oh, never mind the fact. And never mind the fact that you having good relationships with Azag and Sigvald and Archeon is not a given. You can just as easily, in a lot of ways, end up in a war with them. I recommend playing the Vassal game, taking territory, occupying it, building a barracks in it, that's the key here. And then selling it to Azak to at least get him as a vassal as quickly as possible, because you will obviously value uh, this particular settlement, these two settlements, very highly if you do so. That would be my strong recommendation, but even then. Oh, and the best part is, Katrin, uh, Kosalton may not necessarily be a big threat. Katrin, of all the people, my. will absolutely be a big threat. The reason she's going to be a big threat is, look at her starting situation. She starts a war with a minor Kisla faction. She's going to annihilate that minor Kisla faction, then take over all of this territory one way or another, even if she eventually is just confederating them. And that's the point she's going to throw m half a dozen stacks against you with range units that will make your your own into pincushions. Yeah, Catherine might just be the craziest AI faction of Kislev here. Well, there's also the fact that you're just living on borrowed time until Ostankia sorts her stuff up. Uh, because, yeah, if you think Catherine might be a nightmare, no, Ostankia is even worse if she ends up getting a lot of territory. That's Those are the prospects. You can make it work with a lot of vassals and letting them deal with the onslaught, but it can just as easily blow up in your face. At number three is Mogur, the Shadow Gave. Oh yes, the Beastmen are on this list. Typically speaking, the Beastmen are a pretty powerful race within the context of Immortal Empires. Though the problem for the Beastmen is that they have a slower early game and takes time to build up. With a map enlarged like this, they'll have less opportunities to get dread as quickly as possible, so they're going to be even slower than usual. The power is there for the Beastmen. They're a good race. They don't suffer from economic issues or anything like that, but they do need a significant number of dread in order to unlock things. You do have a strong defensive potential, especially as Mogar with all his insanity of chaos corruption, but the problem is you are kind of thrown in on the deep end of the situation. No one, absolutely no one likes the Beastmen except the chaos factions. And even then, they don't really care about you, they're just neutral against you. Thing is, you're in the middle of Bretonia. Oh yes, you've got Rapunz to the west directly and you're directly on her expansion path, so she's likely going to come for you. Now, Rapunz may not necessarily be the biggest problem, but she certainly can throw a significant amount of force against you, in particular because she will start with Leoness, she's gonna start recruiting cavalry, she's gonna get paladins, she's gonna get cavalry, she's gonna get archers, and she's gonna throw all of that against you with two entire provinces under her control from relatively early on in her campaign, and that's just one part of the problem. The other part of the problem, which is even worse, is Lewin. Lewin, who starts with an even more powerful army, has replenishment from the very beginning of his campaign, and now he's no longer held in check by Bellacor's AI. So Lewin, another major issue to deal with, and that's just Bretonia. Now, Bretonia doesn't necessarily have the best armies, but they certainly can do well in terms of field battles because of the cavalry, and yeah, have fun dealing with that. Then you've got the um, th then you've got the Vampire Counts on your Musulon, who are also going to be an issue for you to tackle in this campaign. Oh, and more Bretonians! Like, it, even if you deal with Musulon, you're just encountering Alberic, who is almost certainly going to declare war on you. And even if you deal with all of that, you've got Grom the Punch, he also doesn't really like you, because, again, no one likes the Beastmen. So that's your campaign prospects. Risbrapance, Alberic, Lewin, Grom from the relatively early on in your campaign. Hell, you might just encounter a significant por uh, force under Karl Franz eventually in this particular campaign, because you're also fairly close to him. 
you got no allies. You got no people that are even remotely friendly against you, except like Join starting factions like these man. guys who are at war with the Bretonians, and they're going to be wiped out relatively quickly. So enjoy that dynamic in your campaign that you have to deal with from very, very early on. Being sandwiched by multiple v powerful legendary lords and powerful races that are just going to try and obliterate you because, again, no one likes the Beastmen. I mean, I suppose the best thing you could say about this campaign is the fact that you will certainly be gaining a lot of dread in this campaign rel relatively quickly, but that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, you're going to be thrown into the cauldron of Baal from very, very early on. You do benefit from having that unit capacity of Chaos Spawn, but that's pretty much it. I think Tarox would do quite a lot better in the starting position, but no, Tarox is on vacation. You know how in Immoral Empires he struggles a bit because he has to deal with High Elves and Dark Elves who can obliterate his forces with their range superiority? Well, not in, in the old world, no. He's in the middle of the Empire with no other factions close enough to him except the Changeling who is actually relatively friendly to him and being able to wipe out Talabekland, uh, Talabayim relatively quickly. Oh, Vlad might be a bit, might be an issue. Tarx can hold off Vlad, unlike some other people. Uh, yeah, Mogur is, Mogur got screwed, suffice to say. Also, fun fact about uh, Tarx, he is close enough, like, depending on how you play your campaign, you can encounter Kazrak and help have his help on your side, or Festus, or both. Like, yeah, imagine having Festus as an ally from relatively early on in your campaign. As opposed to maybe potentially somehow uh, getting a deal with maybe Grom or Musulan. And I stress the maybe part because you're not really taking over settlements to be able to trade for diplomatic benefits. And you don't even have diplomatics, uh, diploma diplomacy available again with, against most factions unless they're, we're talking about chaos. Yeah, there's... Um, there's some issues for the Beastmen to tackle here. If you're playing a Beastmen campaign, you have to assume you're going to fight virtually everyone around you unless they're a Chaos faction. That is the assumption you have to work with. And that isn't necessarily too big of a problem, but it is a big of a problem when the factions around you start building up, throwing massive armies against you, and you got no one to rely on. Ends up being something of an issue. And number two is Fey Enchantress. Bretonian factions in general benefit significantly from the Old World campaign, but the poor Fey Enchantress does not. In fact, she's probably got... She has one of the most rough campaigns in the game right now in the Old World mod. See, the thing about the Fey Enchantress, she's in a complicated situation in either Old World or Immortal Empires. In Immortal Empires, she's very close enough to Ikeclaw, and Ikeclaw will use the Underway to attack her. She can't attack him that easily. That's a problem. She's also got Mogur to deal with, though she doesn't have to de uh, deal with Mogur. But what she has to deal with in the campaign is significantly worse than than Mogur could offer in Immortal Empires. Like, I would rather fight 10 Mogurs than what she's going to have to deal with in this campaign. Okay, so to understand her campaign, in Immortal Empires, you can annihilate or wipe out Grom relatively early on. While his army is certainly going to be a problem, the fact that Massive Oracle is only one settlement does severely limit his growth, his potential, his unit recruitment. So Grom's not going to be able to recruit a lot of very powerful armies. You deal with Grom, you then turn your attention to Mogur and Ikeklaw. That's the plan over there. That plan doesn't work here, because Grom is just going to be able to take Massive Oracle relatively quickly. Now, he's closer to Alberic, far closer to Alberic than you are, and so he's likely going to end up in a war with Alberic. Though, if you're hoping Alberic will defeat Grom, well, I wouldn't necessarily bet on on that. To be sure, Alberic is probably not going to be wiped out that easily, but you then but then there's a complication of Musulan. Like, if you're playing Mogur, that's what you want to take advantage, the wars that these factions will declare on one another. Though, keep in mind, it doesn't matter how much they hate each other, they hate you far more if you're Mogur. But, as the Fey Enchantress, we're going to get along with Alberic, but don't get along with Grom and, and Musulan, guess what's going to potentially happen? That's just the northern situation, and yeah, the northern situation is the easier part to tackle. The southern situation, oh, that's a, that's a nightmare level uh, tier. See, one of the things that, and that's, of course, the Kekla. See, one of the things that holds the Kekla some, somewhat in check when we're talking about the AI, and in general when we're talking about Skaif factions, one, usually people hate, hate them, and they're in these kind of starting positions where a lot of legendary lords will gank up on them. 
if I play a legendary campaign of Immortal Empires, I think I've rarely seen a Skaven legendary lord be able to win. Though typically Ikaclaw is not wiped out so easily because Skaven Blight has an enormously powerful garrison that starts with 16 units from the very beginning and it gets only more powerful. That's a tier 1, by the way. The thing is, because suddenly Skaven Blight has a proper province, the potential that Ikaclaw has at his disposal just because of that is far, far higher. And he no longer has Belagar to hold him in check. Like, seriously, Belagar was holding Ikaclaw in check in Immortal Empires in a lot of ways. Also, the proximity of Aphalorum meant that the Wood Elves would also do that. But given the map changes, yeah, you can't count on Aphalorum to hold uh, Ikaclaw in check. And Ikaclaw actually might be the least of your worries over here in the south. Forek might, and I emphasize the might aspect, might eventually show up over here to help you out. But if you're counting on the AI winning wars for you, yeah, good luck with that. That's one of the problems to deal with. Then you've got the Clan Carry and Skaven as well, who are also just going to be wonderful. See, Skaven are a nightmare to deal with when they're controlled by the AI because they get so many recruitment slots, they got uh, such low upkeep that you will end up fighting Doomstack after Doomstack when you're fighting even a minor Skaven faction. The only way I could claw is Nightmare level alone. Uh, and then there's the true horror of the show, and that's the Master Snitch. Like, there's few factions that I'm terrified to ever face in a campaign, and it's not even Warriors of Cast. Archeon can be brutal, but Archeon typically will have like one or two armies, right? Snitch won't just have one or two armies. No, Sk Snitch will have 20 armies if you let them build up. It might be Skaven Slaves, but 20 armies with Skaven Slaves, they'll still win against you. You'll just run out of ammunition and, and, and men. When you're outnumbered by that much, it's brutal. And then there's Snitch himself. Snitch is nightmare fuel for me. Like, I remember ever since this guy, this rodent got introduced in Warhammer 2 that I've been, like, I've always dreaded going up against him because if he ambushes you, and he very much can. He has a benefit to ambushing you. So moving on the field battle, which is obviously something... Uh, moving on the field, which is something you're going to do far more in Immortal Empires than... Uh, and something you're going to do far more in Old World rather than Immortal Empires. Because you won't just be able to hop from settlement to settlement. means you're far more vulnerable. You can move, obviously, in a camp stance. But even then, he can still succeed in that. Because guess what? He gets a benefit to ambushing. Great. That's the first one. Two... He has an army focused on that particular, uh, on taking advantage of the ambushing playstyle, and you've got cavalry and infantry that will break fairly easily. The infantry has um, free with snitch. Snitch is a powerhouse. You don't have a melee lord. In fact, even powerful melee lords can struggle to win against snitch in a duel. You've got a caster lord to throw against snitch. He will tear. He will cut you apart with ease. In, in fact, the only thing that you have from the beginning of the campaign that might be able to slow down Zench, though they won't win, are these Grail Guardians. That is it. That is all you've got to deal with to throw against them. And he's just far enough away, at war with minor factions, he's just going to obliterate everything that stands in his path. The, like, this entire portion of the campaign map is going to belong to Snitch. Let alone the fact that if you do move against Snitch, you then get the added bonus of having to deal with Malagor, who you can't attack because you have to go all over, all the way here, Well, whereas he has the underway. Sure, you can go against Clan, uh, Clan Carrion, but then you have to deal with Unpleasant Climate. Strongly recommend avoiding this campaign unless you really want to deathmatch against Snitch and Ikaclaw and Grom at the same time. Yeah, you really got to feel for the Fae Enchantress. I think if I'm ever going to play a full Bretonian campaign in Old World, like from my experience with Bretonia, uh, my priority is not surviving the early game. My priority if I'm playing any other Bretonian campaign is to try and rush south to save the Fae Enchantress from the numerous foes she has. And like if you're playing Luin, Rapunzel, or Alberic, you have the flexibility to deal with that. Whereas if you're playing the Fae Enchantress, it is the Thunderdome from turn one in this campaign. You know Ikiklaw is going to come for you. You know Snitch is going to come for you. You know Malagor might just join in the fight, and you know Grom might come for you. So she's going to be ganged by Grom, Ikit, and Snitch at the same time. Holy shit. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's an experience, I have to say. Finally, at number one, is Marcus Wolfhart. What, did you think I had forgotten about the miserable empire? No, 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 no. 
The Empire is a pretty rough race, and while Old World can improve situations for Karl Franz, for instance, and Volkmar, Marcus Wolfhart is on the Isle of Doom, just waiting to be obliterated. You do get benefits from Imperial supplies, absolutely, but you're gonna need them desperately in order to survive the onslaught that you're gonna face. I mean, just consider this. The starting army that you have arrayed against you has malevolent dryads, treekin, and a tree man, and it's led by an ancient tree man. That alone is pretty brutal. And you, what do you have to deal with this particular army? Oh yeah, you get a bunch of spearmen, swordsmen, one unit of halberdiers, some archers, and huntsmen. You can win, absolutely. It's not that crazy, but. It's kind of set the, the stage for what this campaign is going to be about because this campaign is going to be Marcus bloody Wolfhart. insanity. You deal with these wood elves, all right. And Yan Bo also starts a war with these wood elves. Yan Bo is the only ally you have on this island of doom. And you're probably going to need them to even have a chance at survival. You deal with the wood elves in a settlement on the last road, then you march over here. And congrats, you then have to deal with Manfred. Now, Manfred is vulnerable to the archers you do have as Marcus Wolfhart, absolutely. You can deal with him, though don't underestimate Manfred's potential. It's He's pretty crazy to deal with when you're playing as Volkmar. Uh, Marcus Wolfhart ain't no freaking Volkmar, suffice to say. So that's gonna be one of your early game struggles. Just one. Then you encounter Grimgore. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Grimgore, like, in the most genuine sense, Grimgore and Snitch are two of the most insane lords. Snitch is generally worse because he can ambush you and annihilate you if he does ambush you. Grimgore doesn't care about such petty tactics. He will come at you directly. He'll come at you with 40 units per army, because remember the one mechanic that the Greenskins have. And Grimgore will eat you alive. He will show no mercy. That's just Grimgore. You could try and play diplomacy to keep him in check, but it's only temporary. It like keep having an alliance with Grimgore is more like uh, just praying he won't decide one day to massacre you, because that's how Grimgore operates. And that's just your initial situation within like six turns. Manfred into Grimgore. That's insane enough. It doesn't get better. <laughs> You do have Yon Bo, as I said, that you could work. Like, one of the things you could do is uh, take these two settlements, then march around the forest directly, sell that to Yon Bo, get the military alliance with them, or at least the defensive alliance. Nakai to the north hates you. Because Lizardmen generally work well with the or factions of order, but Nakai. Uh, but you are despised by the Lizardmen. It's only minus 40 diplomatic relations, but that's enough to turn to make it almost certain that Nakai is going to be primed to go to war against you. Oh, and if you somehow succeed against Nakai, which, by the way, is no bloody given, you then have Mar uh, Marcus Dark, Malice Darkblade, then Bellacor to tackle early on in your campaign. So that's your early game situation, your early game dynamic that you have to deal with. Enjoy. Manfred into Grimgore into Nakai into Malice Darkblade and Bellacor. Any one of these. Even Manfred, as much of a meme we make him out to be, he's still a vampire counselor during Lord. Even Manfred can wipe you out. All of these, like, Grimgore and Manfred potentially at the same time, Bellacor and Malice potentially at the same time, and certainly Nakai is going to be declaring war on you. Bellacor is certainly going to declare war on you. You can just hope Malice Darkblade won't declare war on you as quickly as he could, because he might be tempted to. Uh, and, yeah, that's um, that's your campaign's uh, dynamic. The way I feel about this island, I like the potential of it. I think most campaigns on this island are great. But to me, Marcus Wolfhart is a joke on this island. Like, Volkmar, I think, would work better if you wanted to put an Empire Lord over here. <laughs> it wouldn't kind of make sense over here. Like, I, I get it. It's trying to have the actual rivalry between Nakai and Marcus. But um, there's no rivalry. Marcus Wolfhart is significantly weaker than Nakai. Simple as that. And I'm not fond of Nakai, but I do recognize that he is pretty solid as a Legion Lord. But the problem isn't Nakai. Like, if it was just Nakai, who, by the way, has heavily armored units, you don't have a great deal of armor piercing from the beginning of your campaign, you can get crossbowmen. Yeah, crossbowmen against Saurus, it's uh, not exactly a great matchup, really. If, funnily enough, the 
empire for all its infantry doesn't have any kind of infantry war for them that can hold up against Saurus. That's how we get the meme of Carl Franz shouting how he hates Saurus, because it's true. But Grimgor? Grimgor. Like, gr to, to give context to this, I've played quite a bit of the cast orbs ever since they've come out. I ain't terrified of any bloody faction except Grimgor. I, I have to, if I'm playing any cast orb campaign, Zaytan, Drazov, uh, Astrogoth, what I am doing from turn one in that campaign is I know I'm going to end up in a war with Grimgor, and I have to plan against that because every time I play a cast orb campaign it is insanity. Sometimes, very rarely, you do get exceptionally lucky in that he ends up with a one with Kolik, so Kolik won't win against Grimgor, to be clear, but he will hold them in check. So you do, you do get a bit of a reprieve with respect to that. There's nothing holding Grimgor in check. The, like, this is genuinely far worse than the Immortal Empire situation to deal with Grimgor, because at least there there is a chance that, he, that Kolik holds him in check. And if you're not playing Chaos Orbs, one of them certainly will slow him down, at least. They won't stop him. I, I, I want to straight, straighten this out. No one will stop Grimgor. Not completely. They might keep him bottled up in one or two free provinces, but they won't, oblig they won't defeat him. Um, but here, who's going to stop Grimgor? You're, if you're counting on Yambo doing doing so for you, uh, yeah, good luck with that uh, notion. Maybe you should avoid a war with Manfred and let them let Manfred fight Grimgor. I think Grimgor would just kill Manfred, gain higher levels, and become stronger, and then come for you after if you if you try to play that to uh, uh, to play it like that. No, you ha your best bet here in this campaign is to go after Grimgor directly. Have fun with that.